On July 9th, the Coral Youth Institute Class of 2002 went to the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, California. We entered the museum not knowing what the coming tour would bring. As the tour commences, everyone is silent. Docent Peter Daniels shares his tragic story. I was uh, born in Berlin, Germany in 1936. Now, why is that important? Because in 1936, the Nuremberg Laws were already in force. And the Nuremberg Laws said that anybody who was Jewish living in Germany at the time lost all their civil liberties. And so at the time I was born, I was already I've already lost any civil liberties that I might have had if those Nuremberg laws hadn't been passed. I live with my mother. My father died. We lived in an apartment in Berlin. And every time I left the house, I had to wear a yellow star. Up until the time we went to the concentration camp, my mother was working someplace, and I had to be in the house by myself all day long. It was an apartment. So from about 8 o'clock in the morning, until about six o'clock at night, I was alone. I had some lesson plans to do. My mother told me when to eat, said when to go to sleep, because there was nobody else to babysit me, and she had to work to earn a living. It wasn't much of a living, but she worked in the uniform factory. She said, never ever open up the door for anybody. One day there was a knock on the door, and I looked through the peephole, and sure enough, there were three big men with trench coats. And just like my mother said, don't open up the door for anybody, I opened up the door. And they were the Gestapo. Now I don't know who, if you know who the Gestapo were, they were the state police. They were the police of the Nazis. They are the ones who arrested the Jews to take them away. And uh, they took us, well actually my mother wasn't home. They waited for my mother to come. As Soon as she walked in the door, she knew exactly who they were. They didn't have to tell her. So she walked in and all of us walked out immediately. And we were taken to a basement of an office building in Berlin. And there we were for about two weeks while the Gestapo were rounding up more Jews to be shipped out. They wanted to make sure the trains were nice and full. I was in that basement. One day, a high German official walked through and he spotted me, and he looked at me, and he called over a doctor, a Jewish doctor, who was also waiting to be uh, shipped out, and asked why was my skin turning yellow. It turned out that I had jaundice. So this German official sent me to the hospital, so I did not contaminate the rest of the people there, especially those people who were gonna be sent away to the death camps. He didn't want them to be contaminated. That was a joke. I found out later that that German official was Adolf Eichmann, who was, you've heard the name Adolf Eichmann, he was uh, one of the officials in the Weinstein Conference, and he also was about the fourth in command of Europe at the time, and he was the one that was responsible for rounding up the Jews in, these ca uh, in the countries to make sure that they were being shipped out. Now, I didn't know at the time there was Adolf Eichmann, I remember the German official, but I was told later that's who it was. I came out of the hospital, and then after about another week, we were shipped out to a camp in Czechoslovakia called Theresienstadt. And that was a transit camp. And what was unusual about that camp is very prominent Jews, well-known Jews, were shipped to this camp before they were shipped out to the death camps. The reason they were shipped out to this camp is because Hitler did not want the world to be up, become upset because there were some very well-known and prominent Jews being shipped to the uh, death camps. So he shipped them to this camp where I was in, 
they stayed there for about six or eight months, and then when the, all the news died down about them being taken away, then they were shipped to Auschwitz or Treblinka. Those were the two main camps out of our camp. And when I talk about the problem Jews, I'm talking about scientists, I'm talking about music conductors, I'm talking about psychologists, musicians, people who were well known. He was afraid of the bad publicity that he, he would be getting by shipping him directly out. So we went directly to that camp, my mother and me, and we were separated out, and I lived there for two years in a camp by myself with other children. While I was in that camp for two years, well, actually more than during the three-year period that that camp was working, there were 15,000 children went to that camp and either died there or were shipped out of that camp to other camps for extermination. When the Russians liberated us in 1945, there were 100 children left. And at the time, I didn't know how many children were there. I found out later that I was one of those 100 children that was survived, the 15,000. So it was very emotional for me to have, been, to have been told that, knowing with all the children my age have gone through. I can tell you that I ate one bowl of soup a day, barley soup, one piece of bread once a week, and maybe an occasional potato that we found under the railroad tracks. In 1945, the Russians liberated us because that's where the Russians were coming through, from the east. They came in on May 8th, and the camp was liberated, and from there, my mother and I went back to Berlin. When you saw that liberation film, that man walking by all those buildings that were bombed out, those were actual footage, and I saw Berlin bombed out like that because we came back and I was wandering the streets in 1945, watching all those buildings come, where all those buildings bubbled. And then two years later, we came to America. And I came to New York, and that's where we wound up before we moved out to California. And I was in the children's home, and we were watched all the time. And so we, we, I tried to stay out of everybody's way, and the best way to survive is just to make as little noise as possible and stay out of everybody's way. And so um, we, I was very lucky. Yeah. How, how aware were you of things that were going around you when you were little? How what? How aware were you of what was supposed to come in? When I was before I went into the concentration camps or after? No, when you were in there. In the camp, I knew exactly where I was. Before I went into the camp, I didn't know very much. I knew that we had to wear a star. I knew that the Jews were being persecuted. I knew that. But I didn't know very much. I didn't have a very global view. I was five and six years old. I didn't know much about America or Britain. All I know is that Germany wanted to get rid of the Jews, and we had to be very careful. I saw Hitler twice uh, in parades. He had these parades. And there were a lot of people who really didn't want to see him, but they were forced out of their houses. Sometimes some of those people that you saw out in the streets waving at Hitler, they were not uh, there on their own free will. And so whenever he was going to be at a parade in Berlin, you better be out there. Otherwise, the Gestapo would be out. And if you're sitting in your house not caring, then they start watching you. So he, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the crowds were like they're here. You know, if a politician comes out, you get a lot of crowds out here. Same thing. Uh, so I was, knew what was going on. And in the camp, I knew exactly where we were. I mean, I knew, uh, we, we heard about people going to the death camps. And um, we were going to go to the death camp, too. Uh, but at the time that we were going, uh, it was too late. They were, the, uh, the, uh, the, they were kind of, 1944, if you have any history, the Americans had landed already, and the Germans were desperately trying to get rid of as many Jews as possible. So they were stepping up all the, the gas chamber operation and as much as they could. And so because they did, our camp was not shipping out any more people. Uh, they were shipping out a 1,000 people a day from our camp to go to the death camps. Uh, about October, November 1944, they had to stop it because they were the camps, the camps that they were getting them from, they were just... There's no place to put them. They were just killing them like crazy. Remember the Auschwitz gate, five to 6,000 people every single day. And so they couldn't take any more from the other camps. They actually started to build gas chambers in these other camps. So I, I knew what was going on. Um, was there ever, um, ever a bright side to a situation? Yeah, 
when you went to sleep at night and you uh, didn't get shipped out and you didn't die. Other than that, uh, I can tell you as a youngster, uh, I can't recall a lot of the things that I went through. There's, uh, there's just, we learned to suppress a lot of information. I'm sure there were a lot of bright moments, which I don't recall. I can't give you a, I can't give you a full two years of what was going on. I can just, I just know incidences and, and events that I can piece together. Uh, yeah, they were, they were shipping potatoes into that camp and at night we would sneak out and we, I don't know, we were crazy. We would sneak out, the smallest of us would sneak out underneath the railroad tracks and catch the little potatoes that came through the cracks at the bottom of those cars. And then we would grab as many potatoes as we could, which may have been a half a dozen, bring them back, we would slice them up and put them on the stove. That was a bright time, that was a bright moment. So, you know, little things. Well, they were just a lot of pumping circumstances. There were lots of marching going on there. Hitler would be on his car, you know, the back of his car waving and so forth. And they were anything you saw in the in the film down there when you saw the early part of uh, of the rise of Hitler. Those were typically the type of parades that would hold under these big wide boulevards. And our apartment was near near one of those boulevards, so we had a chance to um, to witness them. I mean. Obviously, they weren't cheering for them. Everybody knew what was going on. Yeah. Why do you like to work here? What? Why do you like to work here? Well, that's a darn good question. I, uh, uh, you know, for many years, I didn't talk about this. You know, I'm 66 years old, and when I came, I came to America, I was 11 years old. And so for many years, I never talked about this at all. I was either a little concerned People don't talk about this because they feel guilty, uh, because other people survived. Many people went through many tragedies, much worse than I did. They lost many members of their families. They came very close to death themselves. And so what happens, they don't talk about it. Then as they get older, they have grandchildren and they have children, and then they come out of this thing a little bit. And then one way of doing it is they speak to other groups. They go to a public place like this and they come out of this thing, so it helps them. And that's probably one of the reasons that I started talk coming over here. And I don't talk as much as some others, you know, maybe two or three times a month, but the kids ask and I will talk and sometimes I tear up a little bit. I get a little emotional because there are a lot of things that went on in my life that I'm not certain about yet, but it helps me. Uh, you probably know more about uh, this than my own kids do. You know, my kids, they've never gone through this. They knew where I was from, but they don't want to hear it. They just don't want to hear it. Now that they're adults, they're a little closer, but when they were your age, they didn't want to hear it. So I didn't talk about it. And uh, the other relatives that we have also survived, they just don't want to talk about it. So now, as we get older, it's important that we talk about it because if, in fact, um, you know, most survivors will not be around in another 10, 15 years. Maybe, if I'm lucky, I'll be around for another 20 years. And then that's it, I was, a, you know, I'm about the last of the breed that can talk about it. Anybody younger than me probably doesn't remember as much because they were way too young. And that's the end of it. You will not hear any more personal stories in about another 15, 20 years. And so I guess we are, you know, people say, you got to talk about it. You know, so I, I do. Thanks. Yeah. How was it like when you were Ah. It was good. It was very nice. Uh, the Russians came. We saw the Russian tanks coming through uh, outside the gates. And uh, believe it or not, they were pretty nice. They threw over chocolate bars and whatever they had, they threw over. They knew who we were. I mean, they'd already liberated some other camps on the way to our camp. So they were not surprised. And so they were very good. Uh, we were very thrilled. They kept order in the camp. People, they didn't open up the gates. People ran out because there was just no place to go. They invited the Red Cross to come in. The Red Cross came in and they maintained order. They brought food trucks in and they made uh, arrangements for people to be going. And it, and um, it was it was a, a wonderful time. For me, I think all, some older people maybe we don't know because a lot of them didn't know what happened to the other families. They, some people lost members of their families. They. 
they didn't know where they were. So it may have been a little different, different for me, but I was happy. I, I knew there was one part of my life that was over. Did somebody have a question over here? Uh, do you have a death of Mike on your phone? No. No, the camp that I was in, they didn't tattoo. They tattooed in some of the other camps, and I never got to those camps. Yeah, I camps. Did, yeah. I didn't feel to eat a full meal. Ah, full meal. Well, you know, the, the, I, I remember the first time I remember having a good full meal was on a ship coming here to America in 1947. Now, I'm sure I ate okay from the time I got out of the camp. We went to DP camp. You know what the DP camp is? It's a displaced person camp. This is like refugee camps because they, we had no homes, we had no place to go. So all these refugees from all over Europe, they had put them in camps. We had to, they had to figure out what we we're going to do with them. So we scattered all over the world uh, from these camps and we came to America. We ate over there, but I remember when we came on a ship leaving Germany to come to America in 1947, I ate, I, nobody was watching me. I just ate and ate and ate. I got sick and I ate more. I got sick and I ate more. So that's what I more remember. I felt great, but I felt sick also. <laughs> uh, did, your mother, um, did your mother tell about her experience? It took a long, long time for her to talk. She remarried a man that she had met. This is a good question. She had met a man in a concentration camp because she was already a widow. In the DP camp, she got married to this man. He was in Buchenwald. He was really, he had gone through a very bad time. He lost everybody in his family, his brothers and sisters. He's the only one who survived. So they got married and I became their stepson and uh, his stepson and they had a baby, my, my half sister, and then we all were together. We came to America. This man never ever said a word about anything he went through. And he went through it worse than we did. He was in a slave labor camp. They moved him from camp to camp. He lost his brothers. He lost his sisters. This man was a bitter, bitter, bitter man. This was his way of coping, I suppose. And so because of, he never talked about it, my mother was always a little shy and a little bit concerned. She didn't want to upset him. When she got together with her friends, they talked about it. But when he was with us, and what other people she never did. And my father, my stepfather, had he talked about it, he would have been a much better man. But he turned out to be a miserable guy that I didn't miss at all when he died. I have to tell you this, he was just a sorry man and it would have helped if he had just opened up a little bit and allowed the world to open up around him. Very good question. And I didn't want to come like him. Do your thoughts still on what happened? I try not to think about it except when I'm talking to people and I, I and, uh, somebody asked me something and I, I I've been typed a few times you know Spielberg show and all that and I had to re think about a lot of things so I could make sense and so I've talked about a few things that um, I needed to make sure that they were clear in my mind that they weren't fabricated you know and uh, but overall I try not to think about it except when I go back to Europe which I go to what message would you like to give to, to us regarding your experience? Well, I just hope that, um, that, that um, hmm, that's, a, that's kind of a tough one to answer. I want you to understand that uh, Germany was not unique in its sense. They practiced bigotry and discrimination and prejudice. They focused in on one group, and it was just devastating. But if we are not careful it could happen in any country in any part of the world if it's just not if we just don't treat other groups uh, with respect and dignity and tolerance it could happen I'm not saying it could happen easily but we are not too far from things that we could pull you know we could easily we could not easily but we could start to uh, scapegoat a particular group because we don't happen to like them or we want to blame somebody for our troubles. And we never know how far it goes. First we separate them and first we move them out. I mean, look, we interned the Japanese during the war and it certainly wasn't a Holocaust, but we, we already were moving in that direction because we did not trust them. We thought that they might be against us. And so we were on the first half a step to separating out a particular group from the rest of society. Luckily, we didn't go further than that, but 
those are the steps that are taken. You know, they're the, they're the words that we speak. First it's just prejudice, and first it's jokes, and then we go a little serious, and then we start to do a little discrimination, and then we start going further and further, and before you know it, we've gone a little bit further than we should have done. So it's important that we really learn to accept other groups because everybody has their wonderful points. And, uh, and the Jews, lo the Germany lost a lot by getting rid of the Jews. Besides their dignity, they lost a lot of progress. They didn't realize all the wonderful things that the Jews contributed. And I think we have to realize that every group has things that they can contribute to a society in whatever way. And we shouldn't forget that. So that's my little way of just saying thank you very much. Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to do it here. Thank you so much for, for being with me. Okay. Okay, folks, we're going to head to the... That's Thursday. Another turning point, a fork stuck in the road Time grabs you by the rest, directs you where to go So make the best of this test and don't ask why It's not a question but a lesson learned in time It's something unpredictable, but in the end is right I hope you had the time of your life So take the photographs and still frames in your mind Hanging on a shelf in good health and good time Tattoos and memories and dead skin on trial For what it's worth, it was worth all the while It's something unpredictable, but in the end is right I hope you had the time of your life